Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Storytellers, uh, episode eight, and we're going to be talking about the King of Comics today. Uh, you don't get a bigger show than when you talk about Jack Kirby because the man was a true creative genius. I thought it would be good to follow up with Jack after Steve Ditko because Steve was the other uh, unsung genius uh, of Marvel Comics and another creative uh, dynamo. But nobody could touch Jack as far as like uh, ideas that would flow out of his mind. Uh, there's so much to discuss with him. I had to focus on something. So I think what we'll talk about is his evolution, his styla stylistic evolution uh, as an artist, uh, starting back in the 1940s uh, when he was uh, doing Captain America. So let us begin. What we see early on in Jack's career is <clears throat> his figure drawings. The characters were very leaf, uh, not the blocky images that uh, people growing up with Marvel Comics tend to think of. And the other thing is that his characters and his panel arrangements uh, were very dynamic, particularly for the times. Jack would have characters leaving the panel, breaking the panel borders, like here. And here is foot coming out. Another foot coming out. Uh, some of the other artistic choices here, these squiggly lines, this, these razor lines make no sense. Um, but, you know, comics were in its infancy, and they're trying to... Uh, uh, spruce it up, I guess, you know, uh, take some chances. But you can see here, you know, you can still see the energy that, that Jack had even back then. And so many people tried to copy that. Um, Mort Meskin, uh, who was a, an amazing artist, uh, very much had this kind of, th that leaf, uh, stretchy figure uh, dynamics to his work. Uh, Mort tended to bring in more of the uh, Kniff school uh, of shadows into his work, uh, and it it was great uh, as well. But uh, you know he couldn't keep up with Kirby's uh, output, that's for sure. <laughs> the Kirby is interesting because there's really five phases of his career uh, as an artist that you uh, where his style begins to change and usually by the end of a decade is when you begin to start to see it morph and to change into what will become the style for that next decade uh the 1940s was captain america newsboy legion um manhunter uh a lot of the the superhero stuff he did for dc then he got it got interrupted when he got drafted into world war ii and then when he came back uh, he was he, his style was beginning to change a little bit, um, and then we get into the 1950s style here, where again his figures are still that leaf kind of look, um, but you're starting to get a little bit more I impressionistic in in how he renders things like wrinkles and stuff like that. Nineteen fifties, obviously, uh, the superhero comics were starting to to, uh, to die out. Uh, you had the um, uh, House on American Activities uh, uh, getting involved in Frederick Wortham, and uh, things were changing in comics. And Kirby had a had mouths to feed, and uh, he stayed working. You know, he he almost single handedly uh, created the romance comic. He and Joe Simon. Uh, so in the 50s, he was doing stuff like this, like Black Magic and um, a Boys Ranch and um, uh, a lot of really interesting um, stuff that was not necessarily superheroes. Uh, you can see here his style again. Uh, now, now we're into the 1950s. This one's 1953. And it looks uh, more like the, the, uh, the previous one, The Fighting American. Um, now some of this, of course, is, is, is the inker. Uh, this appears to be, uh, Joe Simon, uh, to me, uh, Joe had that, that very odd kind of inking style. 
Um, not sure it was great on Kirby, but uh, it is what it is. It's hard to mess Kirby up. <laughs> I mean, really, when you think about it, uh, because the drawings are so so powerful. In the 1950s, well, uh, 40s, 50s, six and through the 60s, um, and I mentioned this in another broadcast that uh, comic book artists felt like they were slumming. You know, they they did not want to be doing comic books. There was no money in it. You know, they got paid crappy rates. The real money was in newspaper strips. Uh, you get a syndicated strip, and it gets into enough papers, and you're 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 on easy street. You know, there's there was never any millionaire comic book creators, but there were millionaire comic strip guys. And they say that uh, the the story goes that Milton Kniff's wife didn't like to cook. Their house didn't even have a kitchen, and they ate at the at the country club all their meals. So uh, that was what these guys wanted to aspire to. And Kirby was no different. Um, this is obviously this is comic book work, but when you see what follows, uh, this is this is gorgeous stuff. This was a uh, failed strip attempt. Uh, called Space Busters that he did. Uh, this was inked by Marvin Stein, um, who worked for the Simon and Kirby studios uh, for many years, inking a lot of stuff. And I can't get enough of this. This is absolutely gorgeous. This is every bit as good as anything that EC put out. Um, it has the dynamics of Kirby. I mean, look at this, the explosion and the machinery. Uh, look at that action here. It's absolutely fantastic. This right here is, looks like it's right out of Wally Wood. You know, so I, I think that Jack was really turning it up at this point because he really wanted to get a syndicate deal. And he eventually did. It was a short-lived one. And uh, he did it with Wally Wood. Um, it's called Sky Masters. Uh, the story behind that strip is, is an entire show unto itself. You should look it up on the internet because that, that was like a complete disaster financially uh, and legally uh, for the guys that did this. But there's no denying the gorgeousness of that artwork. Uh, I actually have a Skymaster strip hanging on my studio wall as well. It's the only Kirby art I own. Um, I got it before all of Kirby's stuff started to go through the roof. <laughs> so now we go into the, uh, the 60s. And this is the style that most people are familiar with with Jack, you know, that sort of um, angular, um, uh, again, very, very bold. You know, it's like he kept ramping it up as each style went along. The the dynamics and the action just kept, kept getting more and more powerful as, as he went on. This is one of my favorite covers that he did. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of Jack's covers, but uh, and he didn't like to do them because uh, he, he was a story guy. He wanted to tell the story. And uh, the, the covers tended to slow him down. Um, but when when he he was on it, you know, uh, he just killed it. I mean, this is this is a great cover. Now, you can't say enough about the power of his work. By this point in his career, he had it down. You know, he 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 was at the top of his game, um, and you know he wasn't he wasn't doing the stuff that he was doing in the 40s where he was having things break panel borders. Uh, he didn't have to do that anymore. The power of, was right there within the panel. Every one of these panels is is a lesson in um, explosive energy. You know, the perspective here, how how that one point perspective of, of Molnir flying towards Mangog, and then this action here with the tail, the, how it spins around, comes out, and then it leads right into the powerful punch. Then again, he uses the perspective of the rocks coming towards us. 
and then eventually this last panel here where it, it zings you know the molnir zings right into the hand of thor you know this is one of my all-time favorite kirby stories uh when i talk about storytelling and i i i, I i'm going to reiterate here again uh uh the uh, importance of of uh, clarity uh, and dynamics and immersion into into your storytelling. This particular story was so immersive for me. Uh, I read it when they they did it as a treasury edition and collected the whole story, but eventually went back and collected the comics from it. But that that story uh, was so immersive for me. It was it just led you in. Um, uh, that's not what I want. I got another panel here somewhere from that story. Where is it? Arg, where are you? I'll get back to you guys. Ah, oh, shit, where is it? Uh, maybe I didn't put it in. Hold on a second here. Let me, uh, see, don't that you did. It's not in. Because it ties in with the, uh, the whole thing with. I don't know what I did with it. Well, I lost the file. But anyway, uh, it was this incredible uh, panel. Uh, the, the story builds and builds and builds. Uh, basically, Mangog is this creature that Odin had sentenced. Uh, it was a planet of people. And he, he, for some reason, encapsulated all the be all these into one being. And he became Mangog. And he gets freed by Uluk the Troll. And he's on a on a vendetta to destroy Asgard by drawing out the Odin sword. It, which would destroy the universe. And so it's every issue is this this plotting. It's almost like the juggernaut is as 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 Mangog is going forward and getting closer and closer to Asgard. And Thor and the the, the uh, his uh, trio of friends and then the, the the hordes of Asgard have to have to fight him and they get the shit beat out of him and everything. And then, then there's this sequence where at the very end where Mangog is pulling the Odin sword and the cosmic stuff is happening as the universe is in destruction and the kirby crackle is everywhere and thor is holding on to the arm of of mangog and he's got molnir is going bam 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 smashing on his hand but he still he can't stop anything you know it's just it's inevitable and eventually odin wakes up and it does his thing and and you know i'm not gonna spoil the whole ending there but it's just an amazingly immersive story and jack does all that uh without uh, where are we? Here we go. Without having to do any kind of funny tricks with his panel arrangements, you know, it's just it's just straight up storytelling, almost like uh, storyboards. So here's another shot from the '60s. This is uh, a good example of the difference an anchor makes. This, uh, I believe, is the cover to Cap One Nine One Hundred Nine. Um, where he's he's actually bursting through a newspaper, uh, which was would have been statted and dropped in here. Uh, but this was inked by Sid Shores. And when Kirby left uh, Captain America, when Simon and Kirby left Captain America, uh, Sid Shores came in and uh, and took over the strip. Uh, a lot of people don't like Sid's art or or his his inks on Kirby, but I really liked it a lot. But those those early Captain Americas, when Cap got his own series, which started at one hundred because they continued the Tales of Suspense numbering, were, were fantastic, I thought. Uh, I thought Stan and Jack were, were killing it from that period. And then Ramita came in for an issue, which just blew me away. And then Buscema came in for an issue. And then Steranko came in for a few issues. And that whole run there from like uh, 100 through 113, uh, something like that, 13, 14. No, no, uh, like 116, something like that. It's just fantastic. Great stuff. But I digress. Uh, this this is a splash page, and it doesn't seem like you know anything in particular, but I, I, I love to use this to point out how Stan and Jack were so on the pulse of dynamic storytelling. This sequence has absolutely nothing to do with the story. This is a, a, a story about Dr. Doom uh, and his time machine. And 
uh, the way to bring you into the story isn't to have people sitting around doing nothing, which you see so prevalently in comics today. People sitting around a pizza shop or a coffee st shop or, so or whatever, talking. You know, these guys knew that it was all about the action. You know, don't make this a boring TV show. Make this a, a, an exciting comic book. And this is the splash page to that story. This dinosaur right here is running amok inside the Baxter building. We've got all hands on deck. Reed reaching for him. The thing, you know, getting ready for action. Johnny getting ready for action. Sue, you know, in 60s fashion, looking scared, you know, the damsel in distress type of thing. Uh, but for the next, like, two or three pages, they're trying to wrangle this little dinosaur. And then we find out at the end that the dinosaur had come through Dr. Doom's time machine, uh, which the Fantastic Four had had since, since Fantastic Four number five. And that's how they introduce you to what's going to be the plot of the story. Uh, and, and of course, you know, these guys were working Marvel style, which meant that uh, Stan would just basically, you know, either tell Jack a plot idea or, or write down a few notes for him and Jack would have to, to carry it. And so this is, this, is, this is Jack, you know, exciting a reader over and getting them sucked into the storyline that's going to come uh, in an exciting way. And you just don't see enough of that. That's one of my favorite characters, The Thing. I just thought we should have a it's clobbering time to show. So now we move into the 1970s. And Jack has left Marvel in uh, 1970, and he goes over to DC, and he creates the New Gods series, uh, and he works on Jimmy Olsen for DC Comics. Those didn't quite work out the way he had hoped for. You know, he had total creative control over those things. Um, but I've heard that the sales were actually pretty good on those things. But for some reason, Carmine Infantito wasn't a big fan and wasn't getting behind it. Um, and Jack's style is changing a little bit here. Now, he's putting in more detail, I think, uh, in, in these 70s stories than he did at the end of his FF run. Because I think, you know, he was probably so disheartened and, and you know. When you just when you quit something, you've decided to quit long before you actually do it. So, you know, I'm assuming Jack was pretty beaten down, was looking to to be more creative. Uh, I never I never really got into the the new god stuff myself. Um, I didn't like uh, Vinnie Coletta's inks on it. I did love Vinny's stuff on Thor. I thought it was a perfect mix for Thor. A lot of people don't like that, but but uh, I thought Vinny was perfect on Thor. He brought texture and, and this other mythic quality to it, but I didn't think it worked for New Gods. And then Mike Royer came in and it was better, but it just that that, that series never never did it for me. The Demon I loved. I loved Commandy and the Demon. I thought those were great. I liked Omac as well. Uh, because they were, uh, Kirby's a writer, he, he's a big idea guy, you know, and he didn't have the nuance that, that Stan brought to it, you know, and that's why, you know, the two of them together were so great. Uh, Jack had great success without Stan and Stan had great success without Jack, but you can see the difference when they're not together. You know, or 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 when Stan wasn't with Ditko, you know, the creative outflow uh, or output on Amazing Spider-Man under Johnny Romita was not the same as it was when it was with Ditko. Um, but here he's getting a little bit more blocky than he was in the 60s. Um, a little bit more uh, um, stylized. Uh, I love this stuff. Uh, there's no shortage of detail and thought put into into Jack's work at this at this stage. I just th I just thought it was great. And look at this abstract stuff. This is from uh, uh, Devil Dinosaur, one of his lesser books when he came back to Marvel in 1976. Uh, but again, you know, you say less. I, I I say lesser books, but 
when we're talking about Jack Kirby, a lesser book from Jack Kirby is like, you know, a home run for somebody else. Uh, this, uh, because just because the, the creative ideas that, that, that were in this, some of the stuff is goofy. Yeah. But damn it, it's enter entertaining. And, and isn't that all you want? You know? Here's another one. I wish I could find a, a larger shot of this explosion, but this was just so awesome. You know, drawing these explosions is it's not easy and making them look like not just stock footage. <laughs> and it, this looks like an, not like anything I've ever seen before. It's so great. By the 80s, uh, Jack had left comics again. You know, he just couldn't stand it anymore. He, and he took a job uh, in animation um, and, you know, kind of winded down his career uh, doing independent comics and stuff like that. But primarily, you know, the, the apex of his career went from the 40s through the 80s. And uh, that's a hell of a run for anybody. Uh, and to keep up that level of, of quality. Uh, to keep those ideas coming, because it wasn't just that he was a hired gun to draw comics. You know, he created this stuff. Uh, he, he he created the comic book fight choreography. Um, he created a visual language that we still use today. Um, you look at John Buscema's stuff when he was working for Dell Comics, and then when he came over to work for Stan, Stan told him, look at Jack's stuff. You know, this is what we're looking for. And when John got what I call Kirby-fied uh, is when you really got to see that power. You know, you had uh, John was more illustrative, yet he still was able to adopt that Kirby power. And, uh, you know, that's why, you know, he went on to be, you know, the guy for Marvel after Kirby. So that pretty much covers... Uh, the stylistic changes in Jack. There's a million different things you, you can talk about with him. And maybe when we get into this thing, we'll, 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 uh, we'll uh, kick some ideas uh, to continue the conversation. Uh, one of the things I do want to touch on was that, you know, there's that Marvel way of working. And, uh, you know, there's people in the Stan camp and then the Kirby camp and never the twain shall meet. And I think that's ridiculous. I think both men contributed greatly to the success of these projects that they worked on. Uh, but there are clearly things that were a one man show. And, and one of them was with Jack was the Silver Surfer. I never liked the Silver Surfer when uh, because when I was a kid uh, looking at comics, it was the Silver Surfer's own book. You know, it was the stuff Stan was writing with with John Buscema. And I just thought the Silver Surfer is so whiny, you know, it's just this is so boring. It's so, such a polemic. Um, but then I read the first appearance of the Silver Surfer in, in Fantastic Four, uh, 48, 49 and 50, that trilogy. And then. He appears later on in 75, 76, and 77 or something like that. And the story with the Silver Surfer is, uh, you know, Stan said, you know, let's have the Fantastic Four fight God. And so Kirby had to create a space god, and he comes up with Galactus. And then there's this guy on a on a flying surfboard, and Stan's like, what's this? And he says, the, 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 that's his herald. I felt that, you know, this 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 creature, this godlike creature needed a herald. And Kirby's idea for the Silver Surfer was that he was a being of pure energy. He was not um, a 1950s sci-fi, you know, um, uh, dude who lived on a planet just like ours, just, you know, crazier looking, uh, who they drove cars just like us. Uh, they ate just like us, you know, and he had a wife just like us, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, lazy adaptation. Uh, I think uh, ruined the Silver Surfer. When you when you see the Silver Surfer in those early FFs, he is a being of energy. He doesn't eat. He doesn't even know what food is. You know, he 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 talks to Alicia and he 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 he, he takes the food and turns it into molecules and energy and and ingests the energy because he was an energy creature. You know, that's why he didn't have any concept of of morality and of. Um, uh, of, of 
angst and, 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 and fear that the earthlings were having and it's why Alicia has to has to Im, 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 imbue that into him and, and, and to, to show him the humanity and what that means and that's what turns the silver surfer against Galactus and that is a great great concept and I wish they would have let Jack do that with the silver surfer and and explore this completely alien creature who doesn't get humanity at all but he discovers it because he's he's marooned here. So anyway, that that's my uh, my two cents on that. Um, not to say that John Buscema's Silver Surfer books weren't amazingly drawn; they were gorgeous, but it lacked that uh, that uh, gravitas. That uh, in fact, my favorite issue of of the Silver Surfer's regular comic is number eighteen, the very last issue, and Kirby came back for it, and the Surfer is he just kicks ass in that. He goes to the uh, uh, what's it called where the Inhumans live? Um, ah, I can't remember what it is, but that, that place that they live. Anyway, he shows up there and he just decimates them, and he's angry at humanity, you know, and all that, and these freaky human hu Inhumans, which I I never liked, and and the Silver Surfer, you know, just wipes wipes him out. Love that. That's the only issue of the Silver Surfer I really, really love. Okay, let's say uh, good evening to people who are here. Uh, leg kick one is here. Hello. Beard Gastromaton. Hail, Sir Nolan. I was lucky to find some Chinoo brew at a local Wegmans with the variant cover logo. I was surprised how smooth the brew was with such a high alcohol content. Go Bills. <laughs> well, that's a Western New York guy. Welcome to the show. Hi, Rob. Hey there, Graham Nolan Comics fan. Storytellers is rapidly becoming the Hall of Legends. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Don Perkins says good evening to everybody. Adam Janis, the real Adam Janis. Love the Chinoo. Just wanted to stop by and let you know. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. For anybody who's new here, the Chinoo is my latest book. Uh, it just started shipping. And uh, the digital files went out to everybody via email. So if you're on the list and you didn't get it in your email, check your spam folder. Hello, Fernando. Victor Thomas, hello. Hyper Kaiju is back. Such a king, Jack Kirby, a true genius, indeed. Nicholas Gear, hey everyone. Elias Wengel, thanks for this video, Mr. Nolan. Kirby are one of my favorites. You know, that's the other thing, you know, Kirby was uh, an acquired taste, and I think it is an acquired taste for a lot of people, because the first thing they see is that that stylized, blocky, you know, squared off fingers stuff. Um, they don't get the, the depth of it until they start reading some of his stuff. I love Jack Kirby, always have, always will. Thanks for showing us. Thank you, Kenneth. John Romita said somebody might be able to draw like Jack, but nobody could think like Jack. Those are words of iron right there. Those are words of iron. Damn cat people. I'm not sure what he's referring to. Jack inked a lot of his own work in the late 40s and 50s. I think Roz even inked some stuff, if I'm not sure, if I'm not uh, wrong on that, Frank. Power of the Art has forced the speech bubbles out of the last two frames. Mark Nelson says, nice Skymaster page. Oh, they were all great <laughs> with Woody inking it. So great. Tech snafu confirmed. On me? Well, I mean, if you're talking about how I couldn't find that image, that's not really a tech snafu. We're still live here, dude, so... Let's hold on. You can't drink yet. The thing Jack was doing three issues a month, 60 pages, and the quality was always there. Yeah. Wonderful trachodon in the Doom page. Is that what it is, Mark? I thought it was a Kirby sore. <laughs> that sounds terrible. A Kirby sore. No. Kirby sores? Let's go with that. Compared to his covers, Jack was great at splash pages. Oh, no doubt about it. Hey, Pete Sametti, how you doing? 
Kirby really wanted to make something great. He should have just made four pages of the same face. Stop limiting our, imagi our imaginations with your art. <laughs> LOL, Pete. Samedi, just got done watching your video from today where you were talking about that. <laughs> That's great, Pete. Thanks for stopping in. Ah, Frank uh, is in agreement with Vinny on four. You know, in the uh, that Kirby magazine that Two Morals puts out, which is is great. Um, you know, they'd put the pencils next to the inks and stuff, and you know there were places where Vinny would like not draw background people that were there, or you know he, he would leave out various things. Some of those editorial choices were probably forced by uh, deadlines. Uh, some of them were forced by uh, the word balloon placements, and some of them were just forced by he wanted to knock them out. But what he did bring to uh, Kirby's stuff was, was again, that, that, that layering, that texturing, which I thought for, for that particular strip was perfect. Publishing Pete Smetty, that conversation between Stanley and Todd McFarlane you posted was great. Well, uh, we'll all have to go over to Pete's uh, archive show and check that out. Well, Noel says, well, I never cared, cared for Kirby's work. I respect and appreciate his work. His, inf his work influenced everyone. I've always noticed friends burn Grummet doing the best job adapting his style. Now, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I just skipped ahead here. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, here we go. Okay. I don't know why it does that. Jack was a very creative guy. He thrived on it. Stifling him must have frustrated him to no end. So true. Mr. Miracle is also great. You mean the Jim Steranko book? <laughs> Kirby said he based it on Jim Steranko. How about his collages with space and the Fantastic Four floating in what looked like a real photograph of space? Uh, not a fan of that myself. They jumped out. Um, probably uh, a lot of it was the printing uh, limitations at the time. But the photographs really jumped out and a lot of them were muddy. Uh, so I wasn't a big fan of those collages. I appreciate them trying to do something different, but um, it, it, it didn't come off for me. John Silver Surfer is the best Silver Surfer run to me. Well, you are wrong. Watch out, the thing is behind you. Yeah, this is this is from that famous uh, issue number 40 where uh, Ben was cured and uh, he has to turn back into the thing to, to defeat Dr. Doom. And it's the first time that Doom is like completely demoralized and defeated because the thing crushes him in like a tin in can it's and this is the sequence where he turns back into the thing i just love that it's such a great issue lol lol i always liked the surfer all the marvel comics at the time to me was a wonderful other world well that's what it's all about you know comics should be entertaining they should be fun um you know one of the the things i get tired of hearing is like oh stan and jack you know they you know, they put politics into their comics. Mm, no, they didn't. They might put some social messages in, but never at the expense of the entertainment. And when you listen to them talk about it, they say that very thing. Uh, they both said that they had one job to sell comic books. That was their job is to sell as many comic books as they could. They didn't, they didn't uh, take lazy with ways out you know when they wanted to make a social message and create a new character a black a character to represent uh uh african americans in our country they didn't just they didn't uh, um race swap another pre-existing character or anything they did the heavy lifting and they created a character that wasn't just a cipher but a character that was a living breathing human being to people that read it 
uh, and the Black Panther and um, is Wakanda and all of that stuff came out of that. Hard work went into it to create that. Um, and so, you know, th th they weren't doing this stuff, you know, um, uh, without first and foremost thinking about the ed uh, the entertainment aspect of it. All right. What in Kirby's work do you try to emulate? Uh, clearly the power. Uh, some of the stuff that, well, the, 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 first, the first Kirby uh, work that I can remember, um, let's see here, is this. This is the first first thing I was ever exposed to uh, with Jack Kirby, and this has everything in it. Uh, it has a monster, which I love, obviously. Um, it has power. It has uh, it's scary. This this cover scared the hell out of me as a kid. Uh, it it its design is amazing. Look at the perspective. He has the perspective here going back. Uh, and drawing you in right to this big creature that's coming down into the sewer. You have reaction up here of these characters. But beyond that, th what really makes this such a great cover is that Kirby puts us at the level of the man running. We are this guy. This is where your horizon line is here. Okay, so we're in the sewer with him. We're at his perspective. And this is this giant thing coming down to grab him. So he puts us as the reader right there. Um, so uh, to answer the question, it's that kind of, of power that I, you know, I try to emulate when, when I'm creating images. His surfer versus Thor is fantastic. Uh, that wasn't him. That was John, or unless you're talking, you're still talking about John Buscema. Yeah, that was fantastic. It almost drove, drove John Buscema out of comics. <laughs> that issue. Ah, The Great Refuge. Yes, thank you, Frank. Couldn't remember it. As I said, I'm not an Inhumans fan, so. I call it the place where they get their ass kicked by the Silver Surfer. Do I have a favorite issue of Kirby's work? Uh, not one, not one issue. Uh, there's, there's many, uh, I love fantastic Four Twelve. the first time the Hulk meets the, the fantastic four. I love that. I love, I love fantastic Four Eleven. the, um, uh, impossible man. Uh, I love the Mangog storyline in Thor, which is like one fifty two through one fifty six, somewhere around there. Love those, that story, those stories. It's hard. You know, it's like saying, do you have a favorite potato chip? Uh, he did create a huge universe. Yes. Yeah, Mark. Uh, just like when I talked about Ditko, you know, they created these, these universes or dimensions and all this other stuff that didn't exist. Uh, but... They were able to bring us into it, you know. When you, when you saw the work of lesser artists doing that kind of fantasy stuff in the '60s and '50s, you know, it was like you know, there was no imagination there. But when Kirby came up with a negative zone, I mean, what do you draw in a negative zone? You know, when he had those pieces of rock, you know, I think he was thinking in terms of like, uh, uh, like micro small things like uh, protons and electrons and neutrons and stuff like that and you know I, maybe a sun or something like that and everything heading towards that it was just it's it's just wonderful and it draws you right into it purple valkyrie is here hello good to see you Uh, do I have any examples of Kirby collages? No, I didn't, I didn't pull any because I, as I said, I didn't care for them. So, okay. Uh, Fawad Siddiqui, 
Another great show topic. Thanks. I always remember being blown away when I first saw the first issues of X-Men in a Masterworks hardcover. His clothing and solid figure work, dynamic movement, just awesome. Yeah, those first, what, 10 issues of X-Men, I think, uh, are great. I, that's the only X-Men I really like is those Kirby ones. Never got, that's another strip or, or series I never got into. I heard Kirby would draw a whole comic in 10 hours. It's possible. You know, the uh, the classic tale of, uh, was it Captain America 110, 111, something like that? He, he did over a weekend. That was right between the Ramita and Steranko, I think, uh, switch over, something like that. Mostly pinups, but it's amazing. Uh, Roz helped with inks here and there. She'd mostly fill in blacks and once in a while do outline, which Jack would punch up. Ah, okay. Thanks for, for squaring that away, Frank. I, I, I knew Roz did something, but it makes sense that she would, wasn't, you know, a trained artist that could actually ink the stuff. People never realized how Jack had a very realistic style. He drew a picture of Roz and some trolls he had drawn. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, he, he stylized because he had to turn this stuff out you know he had to he had to work fast he had uh, mouths to feed and there was page rates that were crap and uh, there was no royalties there was no money uh big money like uh, there can be you know if you create something big and goes on to become multi-billion dollar films like the marvel movies that jack created all that stuff for in the first place but no so you know he had to come up with a style that was, you know, fast and quick. Um, you know, you look at, you know, like I, I always remember a Fantastic Four issue, you know, uh, where the thing picks up a phone. Now, no phone looked like that, but you knew it was a phone. I mean, that phone had to weigh 40 pounds if it weighed an ounce, you know, because the thing picks it up. Um, but the thing about Kirby's work is that it was consistent. It wasn't like there was some badly drawn this, that or other thing prop in the background that immediately takes you out of it. Everything was consistent in Kirby's universe because he was such a professional. Was Kirby neighbor with Frank Zappa? I don't know. Did F Jack and Frazetta ever get together? I don't know that either. I did meet Jack. Um, uh, I, I, I got to meet Stan. I got to meet Jack. I never got to meet Steve Ditko or John Buscema. Um, but I did get to meet a lot of the guys that, that influenced me uh, as an artist. Jim Aparo, John Romita, uh, um, Joe Kubert. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, my regret is I, I didn't get to meet Ditko or Buscema. Those are the two biggest ones. And, and Kurt Swan. I didn't get to meet Kurt. He was another influence on me. But uh, I met Kirby in 1993 at San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, he passed away the following year in 94. And he wasn't he wasn't well. You know, you could tell he was he was a little sick, sickly. Uh, but this was at the height of of nightfall. And I was at the D.C. booth and Chuck and I were sitting there uh, and there's other guys there in a line. And uh, we had a huge line that was going all the way out onto the main floor for people trying to get books and posters uh, signed. And uh, somebody came by and said, hey, Kirby just sat down at his table. And I was like, oh, wow, because I I definitely was I, I wanted to to meet him. So I took my pen and I went, I'm out. I'll be back in a few minutes. I got up. And I went down the aisle and I'm going down this aisle and Kirby is, is perpendicular. He's sitting on the, um, uh, against a wall on the other side. So the aisle is, he's right there in front of me. I can see him and there's nobody there. And I'm high stepping it to get down there. Cause I didn't, you know, I was expecting like this mob to follow him out from wherever he was. And I run up there. I'm out of breath. I shove my hand out like some kind of idiot. And I babbled something. <laughs> About, you know, Mr. Kirby, you know, I, I just want to tell you, you know, how, you know, how influential you've been in my life, you know, with your work and blah, blah, blah. And he was very gracious and kind. And uh, 
you know, I didn't, I didn't even tell him, you know, that, that I was working in the business, you know, cause what do you do to impress Jack Kirby, you know? So I just, I just let him know how much his stories meant to me. And, uh, he was very sweet and kind. Um, and then I left him, you know, left him alone because, uh, you could tell he was tired and he was, you know, he wasn't feeling well. Um, so that was my, that was my encounter with the, with the King. Uh, and I, I just regret that it wasn't in the age of cell phones, you know, where I could have taken a picture. Uh, I didn't have a camera with me or anything like that. So I regret that. Fighting American Jack Kirby, Joe Simon. Jack was CG before CG existed. <laughs> I think they had to invent CG just so they could do Jack Kirby stuff. Like fighting Nazis, it was World War II and used it to tell the story and create characters and villains. Any thoughts on the monster sci-fi work and tales of suspense, Strange Worlds? Oh, well, I mean, I did my two graphic novels. Monster Island was basically based on that kind of stuff. Um, the Fear comic that I showed, um, that was my first exposure to Jack's work was the, his monster stuff. And I love it. it it's so much fun. And he, he, the designs that he would do for each one, uh, him and Ditko, just, you know, crazy monster of the week stuff. It's just <laughs> amazing what they could come up with. Mike Wilkie, hey, howdy, howdy back at you. Fearless free, late again. We'll catch up later. Fearless, fearless, fearless. I find it interesting the Hulk and a Zax character were created in Kirby's Monster Stories. That was the name, using this as a kind of trial. I yeah, I don't know if it was a, if they were using it as a trial, if it was just another monster of the week, and that was the name Stan came up with. Well, you're a lot wrong, Graham. <laughs> He's referring to Silver Surfer comic. Not when you think of the Silver Surfer as an energy being. Ross Hezing told pieces of Jacks later in his career. A Captain Victory piece comes to mind. Okay. Do I own any Kirby original art? Just the uh, just the Sky Masters strip that I mentioned earlier. Like Kick says, he met Stan, but never got to meet Jack, sadly. Ninety-four, has it been that long? I remember his passing. It has indeed. I hope to meet you one day, Graham. Well, I hope I hope to not disappoint. <laughs> All righty, gang. Let's see. Let me just scoot back up here and see if I missed anybody. Sometimes it skips around. Okay, not a tech issue. Not a tech issue. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, I think that covers just about everything. Um, just want to mention, too, that... Uh, uh, my comic, The Chanu, began shipping on Monday. People are starting to receive it. Uh, you can still get on board. It's going to be up for a little while longer, uh, and then it's going to go over to, if I have any issues left over, it'll go over to a website that I'm creating. Um, but if you want to get all the, the extra goodies and stuff, you know, get on board and back it now. Uh, you won't have to wait that long because uh, the books are printed and they're, they're being fulfilled now. So uh, if you're thinking about that, I'd appreciate you going over there to the site. Let's copy it here. We're going to put it into the comment section. There you go. So there it is, in case you're looking for it. Uh, i got a couple more folks popping in here. Let's just see here real quick. I heard he was upset by the 60s Marvel cartoons because they were using his art but never paid him for their second usage in animation. Oh, I believe that. That pissed me off, too. But they, they, they didn't pay for any of that stuff when they made T-shirts and stuff of the Marvel characters. Those guys didn't get any money for that. No reprint fees, no royalties, no nothing. Well, Rob says the Shinu Digital has arrived. Thanks, but I'm holding back for the awesome physical copy. I'm very patient. Well, good. I would wait, too. Uh, the digital one's fine if you want to reread it and stuff. Uh, 
you know, when you're on the, on the go, maybe stuck on a train, plane, boat, or whatever. Um, but the actual hard copy is the best. And where do you see it? Um, it has a this this wonderful matte finish on it, and then this this uh, spot varnish on the blood and on the logos. It really makes it pop. It just feels really great in your hands. So uh, I can't wait till you guys start, you know, getting the hard copy and you know posting about it. I think you're gonna like it a lot. Okay, so next Wednesday, uh, we're going to have another guest. And uh, this particular guest is uh, one of the most flu influential artists of his day. Uh, he influenced so many different people with his style. And he's going to be on to talk about uh, storytelling, uh, as we are wont to do on this show. And uh, so I hope you'll all return next Wednesday when we can welcome the great Michael Golden here to talk about comics and, and his storytelling techniques and a little bit about background and how he approaches things. So that should be a fun show. Uh, not sure about the time yet. Uh, Eight o'clock doesn't really work so great for him. So uh, as soon as I know, I'll put the banner up and uh, let you guys know. Um, Saturday uh, for uh, the Saturday morning Western Roundup. We're going to be uh, doing, as was suggested by somebody last week, uh, Tombstone. We're going to talk about Tombstone. So tune in Saturday morning at uh, 9 o'clock. And then next Wednesday, we'll be back here with the Storytellers with Michael Golden. So I hope you enjoyed the, the Kirby conversation, guys. And you have a great night. And we'll catch you on Saturday. Thank you. Bye-bye.